Are we blessed to be in the house of the Lord this morning? You might think, well, we're not in the building, so how can you say it's the house of the Lord? Well, this is God's creation. God has given us a place to gather today to worship Him, and we thank uh, our teams for setting everything up, our teams for getting the online streaming. Uh, We just want to say thank you, Lord, for His faithful servants. And uh, we praise the Lord for Alan and Jonelle as they serve in the new missional outpost. And Lowell, be praying uh, for this process. Be praying for their move and the repairs that need to be done. And also, uh, I'm excited for the beardathon as well. Um, not that I'm against any beards, uh, but we, we want to love on Alan. Amen? <laughs> love on Alan with a new look. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our series of Ruth has officially ended last week, part five. Uh, we, we ended the series with the title, Will You Be Named in God's Story? And I've been praying, Lord, uh, uh, where, where do we go? And uh, of course, there is another series prepared. Uh, but the Lord laid on my heart to do an epilogue of the series. And I've never done this before, so bear with me. Uh, an epilogue of the book of Ruth uh, with the title, God is Good. Everyone say it with me, God is good. And you might be tempted to say all the time. So when I say God is good, you can say all the time. Ready? God is good. And all the time, it's as if you've heard this before. Uh, it's, it's amazing how we, we say these phrases and they become more or less cliché. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. But like Alan referred to, is God good when you don't get that promotion or when you don't get that raise? Or when that person uh, that you love is going through a difficult time in their health or finances or relationships? Is God still good when, when there's a pandemic going on? And the answer to that is, is yes, he is still good. That is his character. He does not change. He is good. And throughout the book of Ruth, we have learned about loss, loyalty, and liberty. Everyone say loss. Everyone say loyalty. Everyone say liberty. What God has done uh, in orchestrating his plan, not only in the book of Ruth, but throughout all of redemptive history, he has shown up and he has shown off his glory for those who put their faith in him and who obey his will. And so in the first week, just to recap, uh, we learned about listen when God seems silent. In week two, we learned about Ruth clung to Naomi. In week three, we learned nothing just happens. Amen. Amen. Week four, we learned I will do whatever you say, total obedience and surrender. In week five, we learned will you be named in God's story? So let me give you a couple of things and maybe uh, you'll be able to catch uh, the essence of who God is. Is God still good when you lose a job? Is he still good when you go through multiple miscarriages? Is God still good when there is a death in the family of a loved one? Is God still good when you go through a financial crisis? Is God still good when there are struggles in relationships, in families and marriages? Is God still good when your wayward children will not yield to the power of God's love and grace? Is God still good when there is abuse? Is God still good when there is war and famine and poverty? When there's political chaos? When there's a pandemic and there are tsunamis and volcanoes and earthquakes? Hailstones coming down? Is God still good? good? And the answer is yes and amen. God is still good. He is still a good God. Through the storms, through the struggles of life, He is still good. So what can we learn as we come to a close of the book of Ruth? And I want you to continue to read the 85 verses, the book of Ruth, four chapters in your own time of reflection and and meditation. One thing that I want you to carry away today is God is good. Not God was good, 
back in the old good days, the olden days, not God was good or God will be good. God is good. As we look through uh, chapter 1, even when there is a famine in the house of bread, Bethlehem, God is still good. Even when Naomi, Naomi's husband and, their, and her sons die, God is still good. Even when Orpah goes home and Ruth follows Naomi, God is still good. And how can we know that God is good? Well, it's simple. We find in, in Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph saying this to his brothers who sold him. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. In Romans 5.8, we see the goodness of God. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How can we know God is good in the midst of dark times? He's the only one who can turn around evil for good. He's the only sovereign Lord of the universe who can turn around a bad situation to good. And that should give us comfort and hope today. Maybe you're going through that time in your life. Turmoil, despair, depression, hurts, pains, suffering. But as we hold to the goodness of God by faith, we hold on to the goodness of God by what? By faith. We grab on to the, the goodness of God by faith and we will see the goodness of God. And if not in our lifetime, God will unfold his goodness in the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. Because do you think Ruth ever thought while she was obeying the Lord's plan that she would be in the lineage of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the lineage of King David. She probably had no idea what she was doing, but every small step of faith she took in obedience was able to unfold the goodness of God. Do you remember that we have a connection to Ruth even as Jesus followers today? We have a connection to Ruth through Jesus, through the lineage. So God knew what he was doing in Ruth's time, and therefore he knows what he's doing right now. And he knows what he's doing forevermore. So we can trust in him. I don't know about you, but for me, it's, it's easy for me to look at situations and feel like it's just not going well. Even this morning, we do praise God for natural air conditioning. Amen? Uh, but I, I don't want any of you to get hurt because the canopies are going to fall over. And yet God is still in charge and God is still good. It, it doesn't matter if, if things don't work. God is still good. In the midst of darkness, we know that God's faithfulness... Please look at me. Don't look at them. Look at me. Don't look at them. Focus. You guys can sit down. Thank you. In the midst of darkness, we can still look to the light and the love and the goodness of our God. And that's why Christians, us, we do not lose hope. Even when there is a pandemic, even when there are atrocities happening all around us, we recognize that this world is fallen because of sin. This world is fallen because of sin. And Jesus told us, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. And we can trust him and follow him by faith. This week I was praying, Lord, how can I help our people understand how we can honor God? Do you know how you can honor God? You can honor him by trusting him fully. That's how you can honor him. If you want to glorify God and honor God and love God, you trust Him with your children. You trust Him with your family. You trust Him with the financial difficulties. You trust Him with the changing times. You trust Him with the pandemic. You give it all to Him and He is most glorified 
when we can trust him and fully give it over to him. And that is the life of Ruth. That is the life of Naomi. That is the life of Boaz, as we have learned through the past five weeks. God is good. Can I hear an amen? amen. God is good. And what we can do to honor him is to fully trust in his goodness. Yeah, but Pastor Elisha, you don't know my story. Yes, but God does. God doesn't miss a thing. Let me tell you the story of Joseph. Joseph had dreams that God gave to him. He shared the dreams with his family. His family thought he was kind of crazy. I'm paraphrasing. They didn't like him at all. So the brothers of Joseph sold Joseph. They actually wanted to kill him. But God's providence saved his life. He was sold into a foreign land. He was put in situations where he couldn't voice the truth because there were authorities above him that framed him. And then he was sent to prison. He helped the people in prison, but they forgot about him. And yet when the king had dreams that he could not interpret, God was grooming this man of God, Joseph, to be able to interpret the dreams of the king so that he was put in charge to be second in line to the throne of everything in the land of Egypt. How can a slave become the second in line only because God is good? And not only for Joseph, but for the saving of many lives. What about your life? You might think, well, small things don't really matter, God, matter to God, right? It's only the big things. I, I would respectfully agree to disagree with you. The small things matter. Every day, every moment, believing in the God who is good and faithful and righteous and loving and just. And as we follow him, all those steps lead up to the big things that God has for us. And I'm so glad that Alan posed the question today, what is the purpose of your life? Is it just to have a house over your head, roof over your head, and have food on the table, and just live life and retire and, and be able to go on holidays, and, and that's just it? Is that, is that everything we have to life? Is that everything that you have to look forward to? No. No. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have an eternity, a glorious future that we're looking into by the blood of Jesus that was shed for me and for you on the cross on Calvary. God is good in dark situations. God is good when, when, when he's able to give favor to Ruth in being able to glean in the fields without being persecuted without being punished, without being uh, uh, abused. God protects Ruth. God gives Boaz a relationship, a favor. And through chapter 3 and 4, we see the consummation of a covenant marriage, a covenant relationship. God is good in the daytime, in the nighttime. Do you know that our God is a God who does not sleep nor slumber? He continues to work out His good for those who love Him, who have been called according to His purposes. Will you trust Him then? Will you trust Him not only on Sunday mornings when you come to church, but will you trust Him on the Wednesday afternoon when your kids are going ballistic, when, when, when your laundry hasn't been folded for about two and a half months? When your dishes are piled up like this and no one wants to do them for you. When you can't pay your electricity bill, will you still trust him? Will you still give your life to him? Will you devote your everything to him so that he may be glorified through your obedience and faith? Brothers and sisters, I come to you from the same place you're coming at me with. I also have a life. Do, do you know that? Uh, I, I also have a life. I have a wife, beautiful wife. I have two kids. And yes, there is laundry that's not been folded. 
that I need to go and fold by the grace of God. There, there are dishes that need to be, there are meals to be made. There are things to be done, yes. But in spite and despite of all those things, do you know where I find God? As I clean the dishes, as I, as I do the things, uh, the, the minutia of daily life, that's where I find God. Why? Because I invite God to that place. Not just on Sunday mornings, but washing the dishes is my act of worship to God because I know God is good. Folding the laundry holding my children, uh, changing their diaper, well, one of them anyway, changing her diaper. I, I, I find God in every sphere of life for I know God is good. My worship does not end at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. My worship continues for I know God is good. He is with me. He is for me and he is for you. So when you talk to your kids, Remember that God is good and he has shown his goodness to you. So how should you talk to your children? Even if they don't understand what you're trying to say to them or disobey you intentionally over and over and over again, how will you show God's goodness to them? By loving, by being patient and by persevering. Do you know that You and I are no different from the wayward children that we really, really don't like because we turn our backs to God all the time. And yet God's love, perseverance, and kindness woos us back. Come on, my son. Come on, my daughter. Let me show you my goodness. Let me show you my care and love for you. There is no denying God is good. You can search throughout the scriptures. God is good. And we can fully trust in his goodness by faith. Everyone say by faith. By faith we come to him. And by faith we can continue to grow in the experience of God's goodness. Today we have a special time of listening to uh, an interview. Her name is Laura Wilkinson, and she's a a follower of Jesus, but also an Olympic athlete. And we, we want to hear how faith has helped her through fear. Faith has helped her through her family situations and how faith is helping her with her future. So let's, let's hear this testimony. Let's enjoy. And then we'll regroup after this. 30 minute clip.
like, okay, that was great. Like, I'm really glad I experienced that, but I don't want to do it again. I don't want to feel like that again because it's, it's hard and it's scary and it's hard to face. But as you continue to grow and mature as a believer, you kind of crave those moments more because that, that opportunity to be totally dependent on God and need him and need to trust him to get through those things. It's just not like anything else you experience. And and that's what makes us who we are. And that's how he begins to change us and mold us into who he's created us to be. And so through diving is how he's shown me so much of this. And I'm so grateful for this sport that that's how he opened my eyes and, and taught me. It's kind of like my analogy for life and the lessons that I've learned in the sport have really helped me in my life outside of the pool as well. And So in diving, and one of the things I think I was talking to you a little bit about earlier is is one of the scriptures that I love is when he says fear and timidity, you know, I don't give you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love. That's what's poured out by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're facing fear and anxiousness and those kind of things, it's not of God. You know, it's either from you or it's from the world. It's, It's not of him. He is power and he is love and that can overcome everything in this world. And that is what can give you the faith to trust him in those moments. He's bigger than anything that you'll face. Um, and John 16, 33 is one of my favorites too. When he says in this world, you will have tribulation. Like we are, it's not an if you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have challenges and struggles in this world, but it's the best, but in the Bible, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. So anything that we're going to face, God is bigger than that. And he has overcome that and we can trust him in it. And so that's kind of what I've used going forward in my sport. Anytime I face something scary, I've kind of taken that, that leap of like that literal step of faith, kind of like jumping off the platform for the first time. You know, you don't know how you're going to land. Um, you're not real sure if it's going to look the way you want it to look. You don't know how you, where it's going to end up, where it's going to take you. But when you trust God to catch you in those moments, you'll take that step and you're going to trust him with where he puts you in the end. And I really feel like that's kind of how he's led me through my diving career and through my life. And Going into Sydney uh, in 2000 was my first real opportunity at Olympic Games. And so I actually gave up a college scholarship to return home so that I could train full time with no distractions of school or extra competitions. Um, And things were going pretty well until about three months before the Olympic trials, I had a training accident at a competition in Florida and I shattered my right foot in three places. And um, there were three months before the Olympic trials. And that's not exactly what you want to go through. I gave up my college scholarship, everything that was like good and right in my world. And here I like feel like I was like watching sand just slip through my fingers. You know, this dream I had had since I was a little girl. And all of a sudden I didn't know if I could do it. And that, I mean, the moment that happened, it, you know, when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, like all your emotions come to the surface. You know, I was angry. I was sad. I was upset. There was almost relief too. Well, like, Now I don't have an excuse if I don't, you know, people won't blame me if I don't make it, you know, all these weird things that come into your head. I remember like the weight of all of that hitting me in my living room floor and just falling on my knees on my crutches, just bawling and like yelling at God. Like how, how can this be part of my plan? How can I give up all of that to do what I thought you wanted me to do, to take this leap of faith and go after this dream I thought you had given me. And this is, this is what happens. But in those moments, on my living room floor, I realized that he did give me that dream and he brought me here to do something. And I couldn't just stop. I had to see it through. And I didn't want to look back in five years and wonder, well, what, what would he have done if I tried? (laughs) I couldn't live with that. I knew I was there for a reason. I knew I was there to do this. And so I was going to do everything I could to try and get there. And my coach, um, you know, we're both a little crazy. So he helped me think outside the box. And when I was supposed to be in the water training, he would hold my crutches and I would hop like all the way up the ladder to the 10 meter. And I would stand on the other platform and I would go through the actions of my dives. And, uh, I would studied so much video. I had clipped all the dives that I was planning on competing that I had done well in the past. And I would watch them over and over again until they were kind of like burned into my mind. And, with all of that and all of this time and 10 weeks of doing that. Okay. Like almost three, three months, almost of doing that every single day. And the swimmers in the pool next to us started making fun of me. You know, there got to be a point where I was like, how is pretending to die going to get me to the Olympics, let alone on the top of the podium. And, uh, I really wanted to give up in those moments. Like there was really a time that I just, I just felt like quitting. Um, But it was so cool to see how God used my teammates because my teammates weren't my age. I was 22 coming out of college and my, my teammates were anywhere from eight to 18. 
And I think they saw that I was getting kind of frustrated that they had been watching me for weeks doing this thing and pouring my life into it. And I think they had kind of caught the dream a little bit and they started cheering me on and telling me like, Hey, I, I believe in you. I think you can do this. And it got to a point where I would do like a pretend entry into the water on the platform. And they'd be on the other side of the pool going, I didn't see a drop of water. I'd give it a 10, you know, and they, they really got into it, which made me feel like I was part of something again. And I wasn't by myself and I was doing this. And, and it's really shown me that it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your station in life is, where you are, you can impact somebody next to you. If you just love them a little bit, and it doesn't always take a lot, but if you are there and you're willing to be used by God to love on somebody near you, you can change everything for that person. And those kids, they did that for me. They, they just helped encourage me and kind of see me to that finish line. And I think it was about two, two and a half weeks before the Olympic trials, I finally got my cast off and I was able to go. Um, I mean, two weeks of training isn't a whole lot before the Olympic trials, the most important moment of your life. But what we had been through just to get to that point it kind of overwhelmed all the doubts and fears that I had going into it. And I was so thankful and overjoyed just to have that opportunity to, to do this thing and to trust God in the middle of that. I actually ended up winning the trials by over 40 points and making that Olympic team. And so as magical as winning the Olympics was, getting to that point and making the team was almost bigger to me in a lot of ways because God just changed me and brought me to this brand new place that I never thought I would be. That was pretty awesome. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, uh, the the impact of one person uh, stepping out in faith, uh, being able to change the atmosphere uh, of your your um, your friends, uh, you know, the people around you. Uh, that's that's phenomenal. That's the power of God. And uh, I, I sense, you know, a lot of determination and, and grit uh, from you. Um, you, you pushed through. I mean, you said you burned those images, watching videos into your mind and into your heart. And uh, it just helps me, uh, it, even in my own faith, to really burn uh, the, the word of God into me. Uh, I have hidden the word of God, your word in my heart, so that I may not sin against thee. So thank you so much uh, for sharing those key things. Um, you were in eighth place, I believe, going into the uh, 2000 uh, Sydney Olympics finals. Um, what was going through your mind? Um, how did your faith help you overcome, if there were any fears or apprehension, uh, walk us through uh, the, the what, what, was, what was happening? Uh, and was there any scriptures that God was reminding you to, to recite? Help us with that. Um. Yeah, the finals were a little crazy at the Olympics. Uh, almost every round had something crazy happen. And and this is why I love it. At the time, I was kind of a new believer. Um, I think I was about two years into kind of, I, I'd grown up in the church, but I'd really, I think, come to a place of repentance um, about two years before the Sydney Olympics. And and from that point, God really started to, to move and change me in my life. And so I didn't have a whole lot of scriptures memorized. I had a bunch of quotes that I liked, you know what I mean? But I had a few scriptures um, and he like just used those and brought those to life definitely in those moments. And one of my favorite, I have a lot of favorite moments because it was obviously a very <laughs> important competition to me, but in the third round of the finals, so there's, we do five dives in the finals and in my third round. So like you said, I was in eighth place. I was I had a really unfortunate semifinal round and I was about 25 points back behind the leaders, which is a pretty good chunk. And we all had the same degree of difficulty. So it was going to be hard to catch them. But, you know, I knew after what we had been through that I had a lot of heart. And if that's all I had to put into this, that's what I was going with. And our, our first two rounds, I did great. They were solid dives, like eight, eight and a half out of a 10. But the girls ahead of me were getting nines. So I was still kind of falling behind. But the third round, I knew like this is a dive I had done for tens at the trials. I had done it for tens at the nationals right before this. Like it was a dive I knew I could do really well. And so I was kind of trying to get into what we call the athlete zone. It's kind of that, I'm sure you've heard that term. It's that that place you want your mind to be so that everything goes just well. It's like you, you gotta have a little nerves and excitement, but you gotta have just enough to where you can control them and not let them kind of get out of hand. So it's like this 
this feeling and this mindset you've got to be in. And so I like, like a lot of athletes, like to put my headphones on and listen to certain music to kind of get me in that right mindset. And uh, I went to put my headphones on that round and my, this is back in the day. This is not where we could plug our, our phones into the wall. This was back in the Discman days and the batteries in my Discman died. And, you know, usually I'm very prepared and I have extras of everything in my bag, but I didn't pack any extra batteries. And so here I am, the most important moment in my Olympic career, everything I had dreamed of, and my headphones are dead and I have no batteries. And so I'm just sitting there and like anybody, I promptly just panicked. I freaked out. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I can't get into the right headspace. And all of a sudden, I just kind of started laughing. Like I just, I felt ridiculous and God just kind of gave me this piece and, and brought a sermon back from when I was a little girl that I remembered. And I, and I, I love this. And he just uses stuff that you've buried deep within your heart, 10 years before, 15 years before, whatever. He will bring that back up when you need it the most. And I remember I started laughing at myself because I was panicking and I looked down at my hand and all of a sudden I remembered this lesson our pastor had taught us in like junior high or something where he had given us all mustard seeds. And he had put them in our hands. And so we had looked at these mustard seeds. And there's that verse that says, if you have the faith just as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will be done. And I remember looking at that mustard seed, like imagining it in my hand again and thinking, surely I have that much faith. Like that is so tiny in my hand. Surely, surely I have that much faith. You know, and as I was thinking through, I was like, I've done this dive for 10 so many times. This is my favorite dive. This is a dive that I know I can do well. And all of a sudden I was talking myself up and I was really starting to believe like, I can do this. I can do, I know this. I, God has given me this much faith. I know I can do this. And I walked to the end of the platform for that round. And I remember standing so tall, my arms out. And before I even went, I knew it was going to happen. And it was a great dive. It was everything I thought it would be. It was great. And I just, I felt so good. I was like, okay. Like I did it. That's, that's what we wanted to do. I knew I could like, that was this awesome moment of faith. But what happened next was really interesting. So I went in the hot tub. So it's always cold in there. So I went in the hot tub and I went back to my, my place where all my, my towel and things were to wait my turn, but I didn't have my headphones to put back on because batteries were dead. So now I'm hearing the names of all the people being called and their scores, which I don't like to listen to because I don't want to know what's going on. I want to stay in my little zone, but I hear the girl who went after me and it was the top four people were going after me um, because we were seated um, on how we were ranked from the previous rounds. And so I hear this girl, this really good girl, get these really low scores. And I was like, whoa, okay, that's, that's really weird, but I can't worry about that. I got to think about my dive. I got two more dives left. And I hear low scores again and then again and again. And I couldn't see the scoreboard from where I was sitting, but I knew the four girls that had been ahead of me all missed their dives. And I had just hit big. So I didn't know where I was. What I didn't know is I had actually jumped into the lead. But in my head, I knew that I was at least within striking distance. And so I tried to stay calm, you know, knowing I had this next dive. Uh, And what, what happened in the fourth round, and this is kind of the other big round, was it was the dive, it was the action I broke my foot on. And so this dive I had struggled with because you have to come very close to the platform to do it correctly. And I was scared I was going to hit my foot again. Um, it hurt a lot because it was the ball of my foot that I had broken and I was like pressing on it. It was just really painful. And to do this dive right, you had to come close to the platform and I had to push with everything I had on that painful spot. And so it, it had just been a big struggle for me. You know, and I don't have my music. I can't get into my zone. I'm kind of freaking out because now I know I have a shot at this. Um, and I go to my coach, surely he's just going to say all the right things and it will be fine. And he looks at me and he says, do it for Hillary. And he walks off and I'm almost in tears now. because This is the most important moment of my life. And my coach is telling me to do this for a friend and a teammate of mine that died in a car accident three years before. And so I'm walking up the platform and I'm thinking, well, I've got to trust my coach. You know, he's telling me this for some reason. He's pushing my buttons for some reason. And God brings back this very specific memory that I had of my friend Hillary, who had been an Olympic level gymnast. She was uh, the first alternate in the 1992 Olympic trials. And then we had started diving the next year at the same time together. And I remember asking her one year, if you have a chance to go to the Olympics again, like, would you go to the trials? Would you try to make it in diving? And she said, you know, I came so close. I don't know if I could do that again and then not make it, but if anyone on our team is going to do it, you're going to do it. And all these things came flooding back to me. The fact that this was her dream too. 
all those kids, those teammates that were cheering me on, that weren't letting me give up, this was their dream too. And I was kind of their shot at this because not everybody gets a chance to be here. And all of a sudden I was just realizing that this dream I thought was mine, that I worked so hard to get here for, it wasn't just my dream. It was so much bigger than me. And God had brought me here, not just for myself, but for those people too. And to be kind of that symbol for them and, and to be their shot at this dream as well. And I remember thinking like, you know, if, if this is it, if this is my last shot, I've got to not worry about the pain. I have to give this everything I have. I've got to try to come close enough to hit the platform. I can't be worried about hurting myself. Like this is bigger than that. And he's worth it. They're worth it. This dream is worth it. It's bigger than me. It's worth me giving everything that I have. And I hit that dive probably for the first time since I had broken my foot. It was the best one I'd done. It kept me in the lead. And ultimately, I think those two rounds are, are why I ended up winning the Olympic gold medal. So it's really, yeah, very dramatic, <laughs> but very cool. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I Just uh, the fact that God reminded you in, in the moment of, okay, I don't have batteries, you know, in, in my device <laughs> of that mustard seed. Um, it gives me encouragement because I'm a preacher. <laughs> and sometimes I think, I think you're listening. Is this getting in? But uh, by God's grace, it's, it's in you. And the Holy Spirit is able to unfold that. And you're able to move forward in faith. And, and, and congratulations on, on the gold uh, medal at the 2000 uh, Sydney Olympics uh, and many more uh, you've done in your career, of course. Um, so you've achieved so much in your career, uh, but at the same time, um, you're a you're a wife and, and you're a mom. And so, how does your your faith uh, impact and influence uh, your family? And I know that you're in the um, uh, you've been able to adopt as well. If you could share with us uh, some of those uh, wonderful stories, that would be great. Yeah, well, I actually retired in 2008. Um, I was 30 years old. And um, I mean, I was like twice the age of most of my competitors. So I kind of felt like it was time to retire. But it's not that I didn't want to dive anymore. I just, I wanted to be a mom. I was ready for that kind of next chapter in my life. And so, you know, we thought, okay, I'll retire. We'll get pregnant. We'll have kids right away. And it'll be super easy. <laughs> you know, just, just like sports, right? When you work really hard and you do that thing, you know, to get what you want, it should work out that way. And you know, trying to have kids doesn't quite always come that way. And we struggled to get pregnant for a while. And, um, you know, my natural reaction was, well, I want to adopt because my brother was adopted. To me, it was a very normal thing. And uh, I didn't care how I had babies. I just wanted to selfishly have babies. And my husband was not on the same page as me because that was a very foreign concept to him. He's like, eh, you know, like, let's have our own kids first. Let's have biological kids first. And then we'll, then we'll talk about adoption. And um, I was like, but what if we can't have kids, you know, and he just wasn't really willing to go there yet. And so I spent a whole summer really grieving the fact that I didn't think I was going to be a mom. And I struggled with that because I thought if I can't be a diver and I can't be a mom, like, who am I? And what do I do with that? And, and I was, I was really angry at God because I thought, well, if your plan for me isn't to be a mom now, I don't like your plan for me. And, and I, I tried, I tried going to scripture and I got so mad at him in the middle of it. I got stuck. You know, he brought me to second Corinthians 12 and, you know, we're talking about when Paul has the thorn in his side and he's, he's asking God to take it away from him. And he asked like three times and God's answer is my grace is sufficient for you. And that's where I stopped. And I was like, how is this sufficient for me? You're not, he wasn't enough for me in that moment. I realized that if I couldn't be this thing, if I couldn't have kids, if I couldn't be a mom, I didn't feel like God was enough. And I knew there was something really, really wrong with that because God had to be enough for me. He had to be more than what I wanted. He had to be more than my dreams. And I wasn't okay with that. And so I sat in that scripture for months and I grieved the fact that like, maybe he doesn't want me to be a parent. Maybe this isn't what he wants for me. And I, I just struggled because that's not what I wanted. And I just kept praying like, you're, I want you to be enough. I don't feel like you are because I want this more right now than I, I feel like I want what you want for me, if that makes sense. And I had to struggle through that and pray through that. And finally, I kind of came 
came to the point where I could read the rest of the scripture, you know, but my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness and started to realize that when we have those weaknesses and we can boast about those weaknesses, that's when the power of Christ can rest upon us. And then you want to boast in those things because that's when God really works. And that's when the world can see him working because you have these weaknesses. And when he shows up, it's just obvious. It's not you. It's totally him. And so I finally got to the point where I could kind of reconcile that and, and say, whatever it is, that you want for me. I want that, not my dreams. I want your, I want you to change my dreams, my wants, my desires into the desires that you want for me. And, um, and so I think it's, it's in Psalms. I forget which, uh, which number it is where he says, um, I will give you the desires of your heart when you seek me first. And I think that's, that's the part there's, he's not a genie in the bottle here to grant our every wish. It's when we seek him, he will change the very desires in our heart to be his desires. And when I was kind of coming to this point of realizing all that and, and, and wanting that more, he completely changed my husband's heart about adoption and my husband wanted to adopt. And so the very first thing we did was start the adoption process for a little girl from China and I just was through the moon that one day I was going to be a mom. And a year later, we actually had a surprise, found out we were pregnant. And so I was like, I have two kids now, you know, and it was just the best thing ever. And we brought, so when my, my oldest was about a year old, actually she was a year and a half old. And we brought our daughter home from China, who was a year old. They're only six months apart. And we were just over the moon, two sweet little girls. They were like best friends, you know, it was crazy, but it was awesome. So six months later, we thought we want more kids. We're going to adopt again. And we started the process to adopt from Ethiopia and found out three days later, we were pregnant again. <laughs> so we went from no kids to knowing we were going to have four in less than two years. So it was kind of crazy. And our, our process from Ethiopia took almost five years. And, um, that that's a whole other can of worms right there. We we learned how to fight for our children and had to go up against prime ministers and things like that to open up our adoption. But finally, we we're able to bring her home, and it's just it's been crazy and it's been awesome. And I, I love like we were talking about before we started being a parent. God just shows you so many more things through being a parent. How He sees us, and, and it really kind of opens your eyes to how how God sees you and, and how you see your children, and, and it just yeah just changes your perspective in such a beautiful way. That is fantastic, uh, how the Lord orchestrates his divine plan uh, through our submission, surrender, and through our obedience, as you said, aligning our hearts to his will. Uh, let your will be done. And, uh, and when he shows up, he is able to show off his glory. And like you said, we cannot say it was us. It has to be God. And that glorifies him. So what a wonderful Wonderful testimony. Uh, let's let's transition to faith and the future, uh, because I I've been reading up uh, that you were planning to compete uh, at the Tokyo Olympics uh, this year that was supposed to happen. Uh, help us understand uh, how you were dealing with. Uh, well, the the Olympics have been uh, postponed, and how's your preparation been? How's your faith been impacting you in your preparation for the future? Um, I, this is a good question. It was kind of surprising when the Olympics were postponed because it's never happened before. It's been, um, canceled before for world wars. Um, and it's been boycotted by countries, but it's never been postponed. And so that was surreal. Um, but to me, it felt like a gift because I actually had a two level cervical fusion in my neck, uh, about a year and a half ago. And so I spent most of 2019 just trying to get back on the 10 year platform to work my way back up there and just started competing a little bit earlier this spring in 2020 and wasn't sure how I was going to get there and be ready and top notch in time. I mean, it was possible, but it was like, gonna be sliding in the home plate trying to make this work. Um, you know, but I was trying to trust God in the process. And when this happened, I mean, it was just kind of like a whole new opportunity for me because now I have an entire year to make sure this continues healing, that my nerves continue healing and that I have more ample opportunity to actually get my dives off and get confident again. So for me, I, I never thought at 42 as a mom of four, it would be a gift to have an extra year of throwing my body off of a 10 meter platform, but it really does feel like um, a crazy cool gift and that God is, is working and doing something behind the scenes. So it's you know, it's still, it's still hard sometimes, obviously, uh, this is just a different stage in my life to be trying to do this and it really tests my priorities because to be 
you know, an elite level athlete, sometimes you have to be very selfish and you have to do these things that are all about you. And I'm a mom of four, like I can't always do that. And so I've had to really say, these are my priorities. I'm not doing this because my kids come first. And that's been a struggle for me. Not that I don't love my kids, but that I'm just used to, I go into athlete mode because that's who I've been my whole life. And so to really battle those and to really kind of walk the talk, you know what I mean? I can't just say these are my priorities. I have to walk that out. Um, it's been hard, but God just honors it. Like he just continues to honor it. And it doesn't slow me down when I choose my kids first. It's been, it's been very cool to see that and to like trust him again, take that leap of faith again and, and trust him through this. So good. So good. And, uh, uh, as we uh, bring this uh, conversation to a close, uh, we as a congregation have been walking through the book of Ruth, and I know you're familiar with the book, um, 85 verses, uh, four chapters, of course, and we've been learning about loss, uh, loyalty, and liberty for all, and uh, uh, today uh, the sermon uh, is about uh, God is good, God is good. And you've just uh, talked to us uh, about some of the trials and even tribulations that you face, suffering. Um, uh, and, and yet uh, you have discovered God, God is good through faith and how God has unleashed his favor uh, upon you. What would you say uh, to a person that is going through a tough time, perhaps a person going through loss, perhaps a person going through a lot of disappointment, uh, maybe friction or strife in relationships, uh, tough finances, lost a job, lost a family member. Uh, what would you say to them uh, in terms of, of faith uh, and also in terms of how, how good God is in your experience and walk with him? Um, I think to always go to God first, to not seek your answers in the world or from people around you, but to go to God first. Because that's a mistake that I've always made is I try to find my answers with people or with the things around me and, and not always going to God first. But when I go to God first, like when we've struggled with COVID and the things that have been happening, you know, everybody's been experiencing the last six months and I get so angry about things. When I go to God, that's when he starts to open my eyes and he takes care of me. And I've learned that he is enough and he is good no matter what your situation is, no matter what you are going through, what you're dealing with, what you're walking through, he knows and he's overcome it. And he will walk you through it. And he's going to be faithful to that. He's not going to turn his back on you. He's not going to leave you there all by yourself. He may make you walk through something you don't want to walk through, but it's in order to grow you and to make you more like him. There is beauty on the other side. He makes beauty out of ashes, but you have to trust him to do that. That is so important to hear, to go to God first uh, and to hold on to his promises because he has a purpose. Uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know it's been uh, a short time, but still very meaningful time. Uh, how can we be praying for you? I mean, I guess kind of like we just talked about that, that I would always seek God first above everything else um, in whatever situation we're in, that, that he is the answer um, and that I would continue to seek him first. So with that, let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much for the stories of your grace and favor that we have heard through Laura's testimony. Uh, we know uh, that your favor and grace uh, is unlimited. So as Laura uh, steps in uh, with faith uh, in her future, with her family, with her career, uh, and also with her next steps, the next chapter of her life, we pray that you will go before her, bless her. May her life esteem the name of Jesus and may your grace continue to be sufficient for her. Surround her and her family with your holy hosts. Defend them, protect them. Continue to buoy them up and encourage them to have more faith in you. And may you increase in them. Holy Spirit, anoint them. And uh, we just thank you for another uh, family that we've got to uh, come in acquaintance with. Uh, we pray that we will continue to fight the good fight together and be reunited uh, with you for all eternity in heaven, praising you, lifting up your name as we bring more people into your kingdom through our faithfulness. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.